Star Trek Picard season three is underway. If you are watching this and haven't watched last week's episode, go back and watch it because it's off to a hell of a start. We're going to jump straight in. Remember everyone, like, share, subscribe. Yous are all awesome. Let's go. Episode two of season three is called Disengage. Is this them dissing the way Picard likes to get his ship going or is this about something else? I'm sorry, that was a dreadful joke, wasn't it? You're here for my comedy, right? This episode, the way we go, it sort of goes what happens on the Elios to Raffi to the Titan to Raffi and everything. So I'm gonna just discuss Raffi's block first and then I'm gonna discuss kind of everything that happens out in the writing system. I'm assuming by watching this episode that you have watched episode two of Picard. I will be discussing spoilers here. Rafi this week is reeling from the loss of the recruitment center in District 7 on Metallus Prime. She's trying to speak to her handler. Her handler is trying to say basically, whoa, stop. We are stopping the investigation. We have a suspect. It's fine. This feels like misdirection straight away. Also, you kind of get the feeling that, well, you knew Rafi was never going to take that lying down, and she doesn't. She immediately goes and sets up a meeting with her ex, Jay, and I actually have a down that I'm starting with this week. And this down is directed entirely at Jay, right? Because Jay's an ass to her. And one of the reasons this upsets me so much is because he isn't asked her for being so obsessed and getting so overcome with her belief that the synth uprising was done by the Romulans. I am not saying that she handled everything perfectly, but she was vindicated. And a lot of the dialogue here seems to suggest that Jay still doesn't believe that. Now, it's mixed in with very important stuff, like she was absent for the family, Gabe needed a mother, she wasn't around, she was taken over by addiction, Jay managed to get over his addiction, and that is all very important stuff. But at the core of it, Jay still seems to think she was in the wrong the whole time. And that's a down for me, because she has been proved to be correct and to be vindicated. And that choice that he puts in front of her I will either talk to Sneed or I will talk to Gabe, is completely unfair. So Jay, you character, you're getting it down this week. However, I'm giving an up straight away to Sneed. We have a special guest star this week, and that is Aaron Stanford, who I'm sure you probably remember best from the remake of The Hills Have Eyes. No, 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 you probably remember him best as Pyro from X-Men 2 and X-Men 3, or most likely, you know him from 12 Monkeys. Based on these two episodes, Star Trek Picard Season 3 is 12 Monkeys Season 5. There's, 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 we've already got Todd Stashwick, we've got Aaron Stanford. Now, he is great as Sneed. He is a lot of fun. He plays this Ferengi with absolute relish. He is completely in control of the entire situation as a gangster. He's a scumbag, but he's not a lovely scumbag in the way that, like... Quark was a bit of a lovely scumbag. He was a scumbag, but he was nice at heart. This guy, not nice. Not nice at heart. He plays him to absolute perfection. Raffi's story on District 6 or on Metallus Prime sort of culminates in this scene. She is unfortunate in the back foot when she goes into this meeting. She has set herself up as she wants to get information. This supposed suspect, Laroque Toluca, who is a Romulan agent that Sneed apparently sold this portal weapon to. She says, oh, I'm working for him. We know it wasn't him. Sneed's like, mm, yeah, but... I've got to Luca's head, so I know you're not working for him. Oh dear, oh Rafi, you've walked into the snake's den and you haven't brought anything to fight with. It's worrying and, it's, and it just goes to show as well that how far she will go to try and get the job done to the point where sometimes she will charge in blind. We have seen this in Rafi before. So actually, even though I'm really, no, no, actually not even though, I am really enjoying this both consistency in Rafi's character as well as a development. But you know where I'm going with this next. Rafi gets made, pointed blade goes straight through the back of a supposed Romulan, a lot of chopping going on, Sneed goes from snarling and sniveling to his head bouncing across the floor, Rafi is lifted up off the ground, and Worf. Oh my god, in that one second Michael Dorn is back. 
Michael Dorn has not lost any of it. It makes perfect sense that Worf is her handler. If you look at the style of speech, denied, denied. If that's not a joke about Worf, I don't know what is. You are a warrior. I do. I just love this. Do not seek blame. I love the return of Worf. And of course, that was going to be my Latinum up. Also, up for the Klingon theme. Sorry, but this is the first time we've heard the Klingon theme since Star Trek Insurrection. Definitely feeling aggressive tendency, sir. Sorry. Love it. Fanboying. This is fantastic. Now, we don't get an awful lot of the Rafi storyline in this episode, although I do have a fun story for you. In my lovely down, that is Jay, when we were watching this at the premiere, the sound cut out. There was an audio problem and we were like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. It's a bit cool when you're sitting in a cinema and Michelle Hurd stands up and says, if you like, I can tell you what she's saying. Priceless. Back we go to what is effectively our main plot, which is, of course, the mystery of Jack Crusher, the Elios, and what's going on in the writing system. First of all, for this section, Jack Crusher. Ed Spilliers is so good in this episode. I did worry. Final season, new character. Uh, as a, there, is, there is a challenge with that of whether it will pay off or not. Sometimes it does. Look at Esri Dax, I would argue that Nicole DeBoer just slotted in perfectly in the final season of DS9. And then there's other times when the gamble just doesn't pay off. Now I realise we're only one episode really in with Jack, but I really like how he interacts with everyone else. And now I think there's, there's no point in me trying to drag this out, okay? We know Jack Crusher is the son of Beverly Crusher and Jean-Luc Picard. And when you know that, and you go back and watch the episode again, which I have done, you start to see how well they're dropping breadcrumbs about this. First of all, I just love the opening scene. You've got, you know, Ed is there. He's very, he seems kind of like a, I don't know, a bit of a Mal Reynolds from Firefly. He's both confident, but he's doing the right thing, but he's doing the wrong way of doing it, you know. Standard smuggler stuff. It's more endearing than it is cocky, because that is a fine line to walk, and I think he does it very well. Get that sort of, the little bit of bravado that was the end of the last episode and the little bit of bravado that's the start of this episode. And you see he does not care about the rank of Picard and Riker because, well, for one thing, he's not Starfleet, so it wouldn't make a difference to him. But also he's like, we have much more pressing issues here. Actually, I have to say, my next up comes entirely from the interplay between Spilliers and Stewart. Jean-Luc and Jack Crusher are so good together. And there's so much is done with minimalism in this episode. There's a lot that is consigned to facial expression. There's a lot that is assigned, assigned to body language. And a lot that is, is, is sort of assigned to, say, where Jack might be a little bit bigger, a little bit you know, more expressive. And Jean-Luc is very internalized, particularly in this episode because of the discomfort. It plays so well, watch the episode back again, and when you have questions being posed to Jean-Luc about kind of like, do you not see what's going on here? He doesn't say no, he just doesn't answer. And it's, it's written all over his face. The two of them in this episode are, uh, it's so good, and particularly the scene at the brig. Now that is good because neither of them are saying the thing that they both no is the truth. There is, there, there's one thing that jumped out at me that unfortunately I, I must down. In that opening scene, well the very opening you see, two weeks ago, and the Fenris Rangers meet up with Jack and effectively sell him out to who we will learn is Vatic. Uh, and then he says, not a couple of minutes later, we've been on the run for months, it started with Fenris Rangers. Now we were talking behind the scenes about this and we were like, maybe it was different Fenris Rangers, but I personally feel he's very relaxed for it to be different Fenris Rangers, if that makes sense. So for me, that was kind of like a, huh, okay, eh, your time's a little bit off there. Um, so that was a down for me. And actually, there is one thing as well in that Brig scene, which overall I loved, and where Jack is talking about just how much he and Beverly were all in this together. She taught him how to basically kick ass, how to be a good doctor, how to be a worry to the fathers of daughters everywhere. And I have to down that, that, that was like, your mum taught you to be a bit of a bastard to women? So I reckon that was just kind of an awkward phrasing, but to me it was just like, oh, okay. I mean, like, I know we all change, but Beverly, what are you teaching your son to do? Todd Stashwick. I have to say how much I'm enjoying 
Captain Shaw. And I have read all of the comments about how much people hate him and how dare he speak to Jean-Luc and Riker like that and how dare he show such disrespect. And I, I totally understand. And yet I think Todd is playing this perfectly because I saw on Twitter some great comparisons between Captain Shaw and people like Captain Esteban from Star Trek 3 and Captain Styles as well, Star Trek 3. And I thought, I see it, I do. He's very, obviously he's by the book, we like meter, we like organization, and yet you're, you're still like, there's still much more of a personality to him. Now obviously we have more room to explore that personality in a series than we did with poor JT Esteban who, yeah, when you see a Klingon bird of prey, you cloak and raise the shields, will you? It's like we're meant to dislike him. And because of that, I don't. You know? And that I'm enjoying. That I'm very much enjoying. Um, can't say is I love the way he speaks to John Luke and Riker, but I totally understand why he's acting the way that he does. His primary concern, his primary concern, is looking after his ship and the people on his ship. And when you look at it through that lens, now put aside everything with Seven slash Annika, put that aside. But if you look at it through that lens, is he doing anything wrong? That Titan warp in to break that tractor beam? That was such an up. Up, perhaps unsurprisingly, Riker. Riker is the one who seems to get from the beginning that Jack and Picard are. Go back to season one. He got from Soji's head tilt that she was Data's daughter. Riker's quick. And when he sees the interaction, he sees the way that Jack is acting and he just, he gets it straight away. And he's the one who's kind of like asking the question, seriously, Jean-Luc, are you not seeing what I'm seeing? And again, Picard is obviously not denying it. He's simply saying, I'm just not ready to talk about it. That's, that's what I get off it. But he's so good because he's not pushing, but also he's there. Come on, man. Come on. It's really well handled, I have to say. And again, what also really works is it's not just two characters who know each other very well. Clearly, the fact that Jonathan Frakes and Patrick Stewart know each other so well works perfectly in these scenes because there is a familiarity there that is hard to fake. It's so well handled. And like I said, yeah, Riker to me in this episode, when he doesn't have an awful lot to do, is still one of the absolute highlights. Shaw makes the decision, we need to talk to who we're facing here because we've engaged them. I mean, like, we could turn around and run, but they're just going to chase us. So they open hailing frequencies and we get, finally, Amanda Plummer as Vadik up. I, I didn't know what to expect really from the trailers because I thought this clearly is a character who could so easily be one of those chew all the scenery that's not bolted down kind of characters. Homer manages to balance that I am in total control and can do whatever I want level of camp with this absolute con like distempered control. Oh my god, it's so well done. I love that there seems to be deliberate nods to, to other characters, which I'll cover in Cetacean Ops. The way she interacts with them, particularly in calling Captain Shaw Liam, I really enjoy. But everything from her design to her posture to the way that she speaks to them is just chilling because you know that if she makes one command, they are she shows that she obviously knows a lot about them. She speaks about Shaw's personnel file. She speaks about, she knows Jean-Luc Picard very well. She chucks a ship at them. That was cool. She, you know, she grabs the, the SS Elios in the tractor beam slash repulsor beam, I guess, and chucks it at the Titan. That is an up. A down is the fact that that's when Shaw decides to put the shields up. They weren't up already? As the crew scramble to get everything, you know, sort of okay again, uh, Shaw asks what happened. And Ensign LaForge, who remember, I love Ensign LaForge, turns around and if my father taught me anything, it's that there's nothing in that we get it, you're LaForge's daughter. Before you say anything, is this harsh? Possibly, but we know that she is Sydney LaForge. We know that. So it doesn't need to be telegraphed as hard as it was here. So that, that to me, it just stood out just a tiny little bit too much, especially in a scene where they just had a ship thrown at them. You know, it would be, 
it seems like a very awkward inclusion of the, hey, do you remember who my dad is? We know, and I do like how Shaw reacts to that. What follows is the Brig scene, which we've already talked about because we're running through the fact that no, actually Jack is a fugitive. Shaw decides, well, maybe we are gonna give him over to Vadik because, you know, she seems to have a legit claim. And again, I've got to look after the 500 people on this starship. Do understand where he is coming from. Wh where do you draw the line at duty? Where, you know, where do you do it? In the same way, I guess you could say that when Seven is relieved of duty and confined to quarters, but then Jack escapes from the brig, she says, well, okay, maybe it's my duty to sit in my quarters, but screw that. We're going to go and find Jack, which she does. And it's revealed, of course, Jack wasn't trying to run away. He was trying to sacrifice himself to Vadik. There is a moment where Shaw's like, Phew, problem solved. All right, cool. Let's beam him over and go for lunch. And then we get what is probably my favorite scene of the episode. If I could give two latinum ups, I would, but I stand by my latinum up. But this scene of Crusher, Riker, and Picard on the bridge, not a word of dialogue. It's all done in meaningful looks, in glares, and eye contact. There's nothing said for a second. Another quick up, Stephen Barton, taken up for the music for this scene. Okay, prepare to hand over, and Picard starts in, Belay that order, Admiral's orders. Shaw asks, what are you doing? And Picard, of course, says, he's my son. The episode ends with the Titan going, oh, for God's sake, all right, take us into the nebula because for the Shaw haters out there, he was never given away, Picard's son. There's a lot going on in this episode and it's one of those ones where I am already chomping at the bit for episode three to drop. But so far, the action in this and the setup for the story, it's only dialed up the pace. Now, let's grab a breath, shall we? And go to Cetacean Observations. We open the episode with the song Star Child by Baby. Then, of course, we get the name Jack Crusher, the Mariposa. So, of course, the Mariposa, we're going back to season two and Teresa's clinic in L.A. So let's not forget that. We talk about we're going into orbit of Sarnia Prime. Now, I had a quick look at this and Sarnia is an area in Canada where James Doohan, of course, Scotty, spent a good bit of his youth. We see the Fenris Ranger ships again. The crate of Romulan ale is marked as Cordrazine, which is what McCoy was accidentally pumped full of in the episode The City on the Edge of Forever, which drove him a little bit nuts. The introduction of the Shrike is met with music that is very evocative of both the original series Romulan theme, written by Fred Steiner, and the Narada theme, written by Michael Giacchino. We have another shout out, of course, to the Rangers. Then we get Klingons are getting a shout out, and people in Starfleet uniforms, not necessarily Starfleet themselves. As we scan through what the Shrike could be, there's a blink and you'll miss it, Romulan into Derodex Warbird, and also then the Cardassian freighter Grumal. Hold up, there's even more. There's a Vulcan shuttle with a warp sled in there and a Jem'Hadar battlecruiser. The three torpedoes that are fired at from the Shrike to the Elios and the shuttle, they look exactly the same as the three quantum torpedoes, different color, that were fired from the Enterprise-E toward the Phoenix in Star Trek First Contact. The shuttle is named Savik, taken up. Sneed's associates. We have Jay, who's Rafi's husband. We have Morn of Luria. We have Quark of Ferenginar. We have Brunt of Ferenginar. And we have Thadian O'Connor. We talk about how Sneed was arrested on Cardassia and sent to a Bajoran labor camp for two years. He was then jailed for arson on DS9. When Vadik is trying to beam Jack away from the Elios, we see a medical away kit that we would recognize from the next generation. We see that Mariposa logo is on the side of a shelving kit. And yes, one that I missed last week, and thank you for pointing out, was there's a photo of Wesley Crusher there as well. There's also a first contact tricorder just tucked in beside it. Jack's phaser, which was confirmed on Twitter, is like a hybrid of the original series phaser and the Assault Phaser from Star Trek 5 and 6. The Elios gets its name from the Greek Elios, which was, I have it written down here, the embodiment of mercy, clemency, compassion, and pity. Seems like a pretty good name for a medical ship. The Elios's registry number starts with N-A-R. Now, that's actually, if you go back, that's Rick Sternbach and Michael Kuda came up with that type of registry for merchant-type vessels, which were still Federation, but not Starfleet. 
and it's to do with their own involvement in the National Association of Rocketing. The Shrike is said to contain isolated burst warheads, which we'll remember from Star Trek Insurrection. One of Jack Crusher's aliases is James Cole, which to all 12 Monkeys fans out there knows is the name of Aaron Stanford's character in 12 Monkeys. Also, I saw John Carson as one of the aliases and here's Johnny. Jack is wanted for crime on Andoria, for actual terrorism on Binar 3. Remember the Binars from the episode whose name I could not pronounce as a child, which gave my father no end of laughter. Now he's accused of murdering someone who he then corrects as, no, no, they are Falsettian. So they went into a deep hibernation. Falsettians could be a reference to Nicole Falsetti, who is the assistant to the showrunner. Sneed's clothes are very evocative of those hopped up gerbils that were the very first appearance of the Ferengi in the last outpost in TNG. We have the appearance of a baseball in Sneed's room. Now, it's not Cisco's baseball, but if you include a baseball, it's, it's gonna be a reference to Cisco. You know what I mean? We actually have a bottle of Coke because Sneed says he loves human stuff. Uh, we have a Klingon chalice as well. The head of the Negus's scepter is sitting on a shelf. And we have Slogo Cola, which we only saw before in the <clears throat> non-loved episode of DS9, Profit and Loss. Perfunctory shout out to Section 31. The name of the drug that Sneed gives Rafi Again, 12 monkeys, it's called Splinter because it breaks you apart and puts you back piece by piece. Splinter, of course, being a hugely important plot point in 12 monkeys. When one of the Romulans gets on the wrong end of Worf's Curleth, we see green blood sprayed everywhere. And of course, our Klingon theme. On board the Titan, we have a Trill Doctor, an Orion Nurse, and the Enterprise E sickbay. And we close the episode by hiding in the nebula, just like in Best of Both Worlds, and a little bit like Star Trek Insurrection. That's everything for this week. There is not a chance I didn't miss anything. I mean, I've a fine tooth comb, everyone. So let us know. And I have to say as well, if you're one of those people that likes to look closely at alien fonts and alien writings, check out Jorg Hillebrand's Twitter account because, oh my good gracious, does that man have a good eye. And he is really, really, really raising the game and catching these. So thank you, York, for everything that you've already done. Everyone, please make sure you go out and check out his stuff as well. Folks, let us know what you thought of the episode. Let us know in the comments below. Let us know on social media because are you as excited after episode two as you were after episode one? Do you think this is the worst thing that's ever happened to Star Trek ever? We want to know. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch us on Instagram at Trek Culture YT as well. Well, you can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on the various socials as well, at Prince Trek over on Instagram. Yous are awesome, yous are wonderful. Make sure that you live long and prosper till I'm talking to you again. Look after each other. There is a lot going on in the world at the moment that if you just drop in and just be a shoulder and be there for other people, I think that will make an awful lot of difference. Remember everyone, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. Have a good week. Make it so.